Hey everybody, my name is Stephen Bowles, uh, and you're listening to the Production Channel, where we bring you the latest, greatest uh, around the industry, audio, video, lights, technical, news, broadcast, sports, the whole thing. All that good uh, stuff. And so we're, all the goodies. And so I'm joined by my good friend here, Clem uh, Herod. Welcome, Clem. Yo, greetings. Hello. <laughs> so, Clem, uh, real quick before we talk about who we got on today, which I'm really excited about that, uh, for anyone who's new listening to the Production Channel, tell them. What are we doing here? What is the production channel? Well, production channel is just a place for us to gather as a community, talk about our industry, talk about our lives, talk about the things that matter, talk about new technology, how we got our start, where do we see ourselves going, all the things that you want to talk about or feel the need to talk about with a coworker, not during show. That's right. Basically, all the stuff either you're talking on a private channel backstage or you wish you could talk about, but your show was too busy, and so you didn't get a chance to actually just hang around and catch up with the peep, with different peeps. So, anyways, that's awesome. Basically, uh, we're here to talk about you guys, talk about this industry. Uh, and today, we're joined by uh, and with Steve Mitchell. Steve Mitchell's with the Audio Distillery. So, welcome, Steve. Hey, guys. <laughs> um, so, Steve, just a little bit of background on him. He is, uh, you know, 20 years audio engineer, A1, A2, A3, A1, A2, A4, <laughs> all of them. Uh, and he's he's worked with really a wide range uh, of parts in, uh, of the industry, everything from uh, doing music and a little bit of stuff on his own, but also uh, with Disney, doing really big events with them back in the day, then LMG, uh, and now even... Uh, broke out freelance and now working for the audio distillery. So with that, Clem, get us started with Steve. Hey everybody, we're here with Steve Mitchell, number one audio guy in the nation. So That's I've right. been told. So oh, I've been boy. told. Oh, or boy. I guess so he's told us. <laughs> oh, no. Right. I saw him tweet it the other day. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. I'm not even on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because Steve Mitchell's a tw- Twitter guy. Yeah. <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> Twitter. So- so, Steve, man, just give us some background on uh, how you became interested in this industry. How you got? How did you get your start? Well, funny story, uh, I guess, is when I was really little. My dad was a musician, and uh, I was running around the studio, and I wanted to be a rock star. You know, I wanted to play guitar and stuff like that. And, and my mother, with a worried head, <laughs> didn't want me to go <laughs> that route. So... <laughs> Because she, you know, I had to witness kind of what was going on. You know, it's it's tough to be a musician. And I remember her saying, look at this guy over here. He's, you know, moving these faders. And the, that's kind of a, that's kind of cool too, you know. And I, you know, ignored her all the way up into my teenage years trying to still be a rock star. Mm-hmm. And uh, Did you have long hair back then, Steve? Oh, yeah, man. I did. <laughs> did you really? Oh, I have uh, to see that photo. <laughs> I'll have to get you a picture. It's, it's, it's pretty tragic. But, uh, but yeah, I had a lot of fun. And uh, realized, you know, keeping a band together is like herding cats. So uh, mm-hmm. I quickly started doing studio work. And my dad, uh, I've always joked, he's like the Sanford and son of musical equipment. He's always had, <laughs> you know, record, recording stuff. Like I mean, it's almost like borderline hoarding, but it is pretty cool stuff he's got. Um, and, you know, he had some old reel-to-reels and stuff like that. And that's what I would record band demos on for the guys in high school. And uh, That's awesome. Yeah, it's all I've ever really done. I worked in music store, worked in you know the studio in the back, and and stuff like that. So it's pretty much all I've ever done. And, and then, then how'd you get into yeah. the live side of it, into the actual show side of it? Um, that was you know that was weird too. I, I went to school for uh, uh, recording industry, and I thought Where'd you I go? To work Middle Tennessee State. So there's a lot of guys. Uh, a lot of guys that have gone there, Shane Smith and, and uh, Brian T., a lot of great audio guys that come out of there, ironically enough. And I didn't know these guys when we were going there. We didn't know each other until you, Were you there around the same time? Yeah, we were. That's, wow. That's oh, wow. the crazy part, you know. Small industry. I know. And um, so we all went there, and we went to school for working in a recording studio. And by the time we got out, I don't know about them, but I was so tired of going in the studio when the sun went down and coming out when the sun came up that – I uh, I said, you know, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. And it's sad to come out of uh, spending all money on college and, uh, you know, saying, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Mm. But, uh, and, and it's, it was a hard road ahead there, too, because, you know, even though you 
come out of college, you're going to go spend a couple of years as an intern and just, you know, making coffee for anybody and everybody to, you know, to go uh, any further with it. <clears throat> but so finally, I, uh, as a bet or a dare from a roommate of mine, he, uh, Disney came into town and was doing uh, interviews and he said, that'd be funny if you interviewed. And I was like, why would that be funny? He's like, cause you got long hair and they would never hire you. <laughs> so, 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 so as a, he's like, I'll buy the beers uh, later at the bar if you go. And he's like, it'll be entertaining for me to see you <laughs> interview and, you know, but, uh, so I went and I guess I had a car too. So that's why. Oh yeah. Yeah. You're, you're the guy with the car. <laughs> <laughs> he just needed a ride. That's what it was. Right. And, uh, so I, inter- I interviewed and, uh, you know, forgot all about it. And six, about six months later they called and said, Hey, you want to come down to Orlando and work for Disney? And, uh, it was pretty crazy. And so then how long were you there? Start. I was only at Disney for four years. Uh, as you know, a lot of us came from that, uh, that same department in that area. Um, there's so many of us, um, and they were all great guys, and it was a great time and met so many great people. Uh, but I was only there for four years because there was – I think they were in the process of dissolving the department. Mm. Um, the, the biggest experience I say I got from working at Disney is what it feels like to work for a company that is so huge and mm. just feel like just feel like a, you know, a small fish in a pond. And, and when somebody says, you know, it doesn't make sense that we do it that way. It's just how we do it. And I learned to accept that. <laughs> yeah. So, how the good I, and you, the bads. Yeah, you know, and, and that that kind of you know has, makes me question. Like, at what point, or have you changed that mindset of the whole? This is how we do things. Because not just in our industry, so many different industries, they that the same mentality is just that's just the way things are done. And then it seems like nowadays a lot of people are beginning to question that. Well, why is it done that way? Is there a more efficient way? Is that something that you still believe in, that this is just the way things are done? Um, I, I'm, able to, when I, I'm able to spot somebody when they're in a bind and they're working for a big company as far as our clients and stuff like that. And when they feel like I can see that their hands are tied and there's, you can tell they want to make a difference, they want to change some stuff, but they can't. And when they turn to you and in the heat of the battle, they're just like, man, it's just the way we do things. I, I'm able to say, okay, I understand, you know, this, I'll help you out and we'll do whatever we can. Um, but as far as me and working for myself, um, I think that was one of the blessings of, of it all is to say, you know, to be able to ask why. Uh, if there's ever a question you ever use in life is to ask why about a lot of stuff. And, uh, you know, it's one of the things I try and teach my daughter is like, it's okay to ask why. And uh, if we can't explain it, <laughs> maybe... <laughs> Maybe we need to be doing a better job, but um, but anyway, it's uh, I, I try not to get bogged down in that mentality. I don't have to, as far as what I do personally, but I do have to recognize that with these, some of these bigger companies that we work for, they're just like that's just the way it goes. That's the way we do it, and uh, and it's so it's easier to accept it instead of getting really frustrated. I don't yeah. know if that answers the question. No, it does. I mean, I know um, for, I tend to work with one specific company. And when I work with other people who have experience working with other companies, other production companies, it's nice to learn, you know, new techniques and new ways to do things because it may be more efficient, may be more effective. And then you can bring it. Then that becomes part of your setup or your you know, process and being able to share that with other people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think they, I, I think um, a lot of these big companies, uh, you see them bogged down in the big corporate aspect of things. And I think when they get to work with you or myself or, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of the guys in the industry, I think it's a breath of fresh air to uh, that we're not uh, bogged down in that. And we kind of think outside of the box and we're mm-hmm. able to laugh and joke and, uh, and uh, bring a little more uh, fun to that you know cubicle stuck in a cubicle mentality yeah yeah I, it's well, not a so, cubicle so, but it so, is at the same time <laughs> yeah. yeah right so right. steve you recently went freelance right uh from in terms of like you know your kind of professional career uh i guess it's been about five years now four or five okay. years 
something like that. So, yeah, I guess relatively speaking recently, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess just in the spectrum of your whole thing. Uh, well, actually, here, let me take that again, actually, because you're right. I was totally thinking Jay when I just said that. So <laughs> yeah. I ask you that question. <laughs> no, about to I say, yeah, it's totally been a while. <laughs> it's been a long while. No, let me, let me take that one around again. Um, here we go. So, Steve, you just, you've been basically freelance for the last five years, but before that you had had experience working for – uh, like a larger sort of rental and staging or production company, uh, LMG. I actually used to work for them, so love uh, love the company, love everybody who works there. But talk to me about that. Like, you know, you went from Disney, right, where you're a part of the massive machine and you almost have no ability. Uh, then you're at LMG where there's room, you know, to sort of uh, – apply your own processes it's a smaller more nimble team but then also lmg grew a lot while you're there and now you're on your own where you're kind of uh either working directly with clients or receiving gigs through groups like lmg and others like that just talk to us a little bit about that change from one to the other uh yeah it was a i'd say overall it was a really great experience um the i guess disney and a lot of people this is not news to a lot of people that are in the industry, but Disney was kind of the breeding ground for a lot of the LMG employees. Like, uh, they were able to Mm -hmm. cut their teeth and learn a lot there, uh, work with a lot of high end gear. And, um, and when they were ready, uh, LMG would offer them definitely a better deal. And that wasn't hard to do, but, uh, (laughs) they, but they could. And, um, and, and for me, it wasn't just about the money. Uh, it was also about, following a lot of those great guys I worked with at Disney. They were already over there working at um, at LMG. And, um, I mean, guys like Kevin Bridges, Bryce Hirschner, you know, uh, those guys, I if I just wanted to stay working with those guys. Um, we all had a lot of laughs. We had a lot of fun. Uh, we always learned from each other. And those guys were always pushing themselves to do uh, more stuff and learn more stuff as well. I mean, Bryce Hirschner is just one of the most motivated guys I've ever worked for and worked with. Um, but you know, so it was kind of like, Hey, come work with your friends, you know? Yeah. And, uh, mm-hmm. I said, I said, yeah. And I was also freelance with some other companies, but you know, finally took the dive into the full-time job with LMG and I was there for almost 10 years and, wow. and, uh, you know, you got to watch the company grow. Uh, it's definitely then everything was done on a handshake uh, and um, you know, small time, more boutique type of mentality. And then um, a- as they grew, you know, things weren't a handshake anymore. There was more paperwork involved and stuff like that. Uh, but you know, it's it's a it's a great company, and and they're they're growing in leaps and bounds for sure, and doing amazing things and. I think it got to a certain point. I just said, you know what? I think um, I still like that um, small time mentality, and and uh, the more stuff you get into, where you're just doing it because that's just the way things are, and you know you can, you're able to get away from that a little bit and uh, do your own thing. I think it was just time for me. So, but I, that's great because I still get to work with those guys. I still get to work. They have great gear. Uh, you know, there's a lot of companies that have great gear. And now I'm also able to work with all different com- companies that have uh, great gear and great guys. So that's, yeah. I'd say that's a benefit. Sorry, as you, were, as you were speaking about, you know, great gear and, you know, with LMG, you know, they have a lot of things coming in and going out and a lot of changing equipment and staying abreast on technology. How do you as a freelance or independent contractor stay abreast with gear changing and technology do you take classes or you just kind of learn on site what what do you do to do for that um i i that's one thing i want to get better at it's uh taking more time it, it, you have to take more of a conscious effort uh to set you know book your own flight uh to go to a class or to uh take that time out in your downtime in the summer to go do those classes and learn those things or going to a gig a day early because you know it's in a uh, city where one of the companies is and you're able to go in their shop and check out their new consoles or whatever they are. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it takes a lot more of a conscious effort to do that as opposed to when I was working for a company, they would just schedule training. Or, mm-hmm. you know, I lived, I lived close by to the shop and I would just be able to go in and, and, uh, and check stuff out. Now, granted, there's shops here too, uh, here in Nashville, 
uh, so that I've, I've been able to do that as well. But I need to make a more conscious effort to do it. It's just in, in downtime when you have a family, you want to soak in all that downtime with your family, and it's hard to say, oh, yeah, i got to go uh, grow my brain, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. Well, one of the things, too, that, and I actually want to jump back to that family stuff in a little bit, but, um, you know, when I used to work at LMG, uh, you know, I think one of the craziest parts uh, when you work for a group that large and has that many different events going on all the time is you get this wide spectrum of roles uh, and not in the sense of like I'm an A1 or an A2 I'm a video director or a video engineer from show to show that certainly happens it's more of the gig and the size of the event or the show has such a wide range right so you might be one week you know the A1 or for me you know directing some really massive arena show and then literally the next week you're in the back of some breakout room <laughs> doing a video screen control switcher or something like that some event takes and you're just going between playback and you know graphics or whatever it is so talk to me about that because like for you when you entered into LMG or came out of Disney you know had you even done those sort of large arena level kind of shows uh, what kind of like growth did you find in yourself during that period of time and then since you went freelance what is your kind of show of uh, preference like what do you like to do more do you like to do big shows with that are hard and complex or would you rather do smaller ones but hang with your friends in a really cool spot in Tahoe you know like the more niche kind of uh, events uh, talk to us a little bit about that uh, yeah I, well let's see I'll start with uh, I have I was doing some arena stuff big stuff uh, with Disney and uh, before I left uh, and then with some of the freelance companies I was working with as well because uh, I was able to moonlight and kind of take time off and go do other stuff. But, <clears throat> excuse me, um, yeah, it was, um, I was doing a lot of that stuff. There was a lot of things that, at LMG that uh, made me grow as far as uh, you have to be super responsible for making sure all the gear gets back. It's not like it's just going right down the road. It's going on a tractor trailer and it's going across country. Um they, they held you responsible dealing with the unions. I mean, I had a crazy story in Boston uh, with the Teamsters. They, <laughs> it was funny. Um, I'm sure everybody's got a story like that. But, <laughs> uh, you know, but it, it, it's, it's challenging. There's other parts about it that aren't have no technical uh, aspect to them, but just really just dealing with people and making sure everybody's happy and that you're able to just get the, you know, gear from one place to another and uh, get the – gig done um as far do you feel, as real quick do you feel that uh at lmg there or working for a company like that there was more of this manager part to the job as opposed to just being the lead audio guy uh and really focusing on you know the rig and loading in and getting your stuff set up getting your world set up do you feel like that was different than disney and different than freelance uh, yeah, different than Disney, not different than freelance. I definitely experienced some of that in freelance world. Um, you know, it's still about uh, dealing with the labor unions or the labor companies uh, that are there, making sure the stuff. Yeah, it's it's a lot of management. And speaking of which, I mean, one of the things that I've always said to a lot of people, it's not, uh, and I, I think it goes with all your guys' industry as well. Correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of what we do isn't just the technical side about it, of of or the technical side of our shows, a lot of what we do is managing risk. And it's mm-hmm. whether man- managing risk of, you know, a machine failing, a projector failing, uh, a playback machine failing, a microphone failing. Uh, it's it's managing that risk because, you know, we all know how bad it goes if, if you don't have something to back it up with. Um, so it's, it's, it's a hard... It's a definitely a shift in mentality. There's a lot of guys that get caught up in the artistic side of it, and they're like, well, this is what I do. I mix, and that's all I do, uh, and I want to make it sound the best. And it's like, well, that microphone is the best, but you don't have a backup to it that sounds just as good. So, you know, you might have yeah. to you might have to dumb it down a little bit just to make sure that everything's covered. Um, but uh, to go back to another question you had as far as uh, – you know, doing different things all the time. I I found it was interesting. I I got 
you can kind of get pigeonholed into certain uh, seats. And that can be hard because it makes you rusty in the other seats. Mm. Um, you know, I got pigeonholed doing more front of house stuff. Uh, you know, I guess it came easier for me in uh, dealing with the client and making stage managers feel good uh, or comfortable. But uh, I tell you what, it made it hard to, um, you know, stay up on my chops as far as A2 work and stuff like that. Mm. Um, but I, I do enjoy the smaller shows because they pay the same and uh, <laughs> they're a lot less headache. I yeah. mean, I th- a, lot, a lot less I, risk to manage. <laughs> right. And, and when I was younger, I mean, that was exciting, right? I'm going to put in this, I'm going to go in an arena and put this rig in, in the round and, uh, you know, it's going to be incredible and, and all that. But I tell you what, after a while, um, sometimes that's just, <laughs> it's just, it's, you get paid the same to do, you know, even yeah. a smaller gig too. I know for well, me, sometimes you- I, uh, I, I like to do, I do the smaller shows and I enjoy doing the smaller shows, but sometimes it's nice to get in there and do that arena show just to be like, yeah, I still got it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Abs- absolutely. Because yeah, you wonder like, man, it's been a while since I've been in an arena. Exactly. And then you go back into the arena and you're like, okay, yeah, it's like riding a bike. And luckily, and I saw that show you did, Clem, that looked awesome. And you were able to actually probably get a little more fulfillment out of uh, the oh, artistic definitely. side of it when when definitely. you're able to do the projection stuff that you were doing and that's cool and when yeah. you're able to when you're able to take advantage of that and feel good about that side of it that that's that's great because there's a lot of times we're just uh, the artistic side gets yeah. sucked out of it with a corporate thing one thing Before, I learned oh, too yeah. from that show was um, you know when you do bigger shows you get to an opportunity to work with people who are on your same level too, you know, because just the the demand that the the project, the scale of it is so much larger than your smaller rooms where you might be by yourself and just have some stagehands helping you out. Um, where I was working on that arena show, and the gentleman I was working with, he was you know somewhat impressed by my ability to you know warp and managing the tool set, um, but as we were having our conversation, I was impressed by his just knowledge of the different lamps that the brands of projectors use and the, the ability to, um, of his ability to understand the light temperature or the color temperature that each lamp produces. And it was just like, you know, when you're working around other techs on some of those larger scales shows, it's just like that opportunity to grow and that pat, that exchange of knowledge is beautiful. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. And I, and to, to get, take it a step further, uh, I, I've kind of learned uh, working with different generations has uh, started to open my mind a little bit of how to think about things. Mm. Um, the younger generations, uh, the millennial guys and stuff like that, I think, um, you know, at first I was, I'd was i get frustrated with how, their, how they would work and stuff like that. But then I started realizing, man, they just think about it differently than I do. And there's some things that are pretty cool how they think about this. And they're still very skilled at what they do. Uh, it's just they're they approach it a little bit different. So mm. yeah, not to, not to go too deep into that, but yeah, I totally agree with you. I love working with other people and be able to pick up on what they know and what they do. Uh, I learned something. If you're not learning something, then it gets boring. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, and I, I think that the, the reality of it is, is that once you get uh, sort of established in the industry, uh, enough people know about you, the right, either production companies or rental houses know about you and they're, just booking you on gigs all the time and then you got your regular client list and they're sort of uh, filling a good percentage of your book there be that that repetition game comes into play and I guess the question to you Steve or something to think about uh, really for all three of us but when when you get bored uh, and that's kind of what we're talking about how do you how do you stretch yourself or how do you entertain yourself and I think for me personally, uh, when I was directing cameras and, you know, I actually got highly, uh, like just totally bored, um, because every gig's the same, you know, for, for me, it was just another CEO Mm -hmm. or another VP of whatever up on the stage. And I got to put a tight shot, a head to toe shot and a wide shot, you know, go around the bases. And it's pretty much the same thing, uh, every time, every single time. And so for me, whether it is an arena show or not, that actually didn't, change too much what was going on in terms of what I had to do it would be though when I had like music you know or yeah. bands mm-hmm. uh, right that's fun right? Essence. Yeah. Video didn't you do the Essence music that's festival like, once 
Oh heck yeah, man! I've done that since. I've done, honestly the the way Final I four. measure <laughs> Final Four. Yeah, I, the way I measure a lot of like my like value in terms of like uh, dinner table conversation uh, <laughs> with my friends and my family is never around. Oh my gosh, I I shot the CEO of IBM the other day or anything yeah. like that. It's, it's <laughs> no always doubt. you know I no had doubt. Fallout Boy or I had this you know Aerosmith or whatever. Um, yeah. But I guess to you, Steve, and this is, you know, kind of maybe even pressing a uh, like a little sensitive button. But often from what I've seen, you know, the, the A1 brought in to mix the corporate event doesn't necessarily get to mix the rock and roll often. So how have you sort of navigated that? How much does that, you know, suck or not suck, I guess, is the question. Um, yeah, it can be tough sometimes, but, um, and it, you know, like I've, I've joked, I say that sometimes it sucks the soul out of you, but, um, mm-hmm. but, the, but there's, there's times I get to do a lot of that too. And then on my own, I started mixing bands and stuff like that and getting back into that, uh, off yeah. moonlighting, so to speak, and doing other things. And it's, it's hard because we spend so much time working in the corporate industry. And when you come home, like I said, you know, with your family, to say I, I want to go out and do this and and you know it's not going to pay as well as the corporate stuff and so that's more time away but you know that it's uh it's it's better for your soul it's better for you know you to branch out and to go back to your you know original question of how do you stretch yourself and how do you do those things it's um a lot of people are self-motivated steve you definitely one you you've branched out with show flow and things of that nature uh, to keep things interesting. Um, I remember I had a high school music director one time and I, I told him, man, I'm, I'm just bored with this. I don't think I want to do this anymore. And that was in high school. And he, uh, put it in perspective for me. He had been a music director for 40 years, 30 years, something like that. And, uh, he said, do you think at one point in time, I didn't get bored (laughs) in that 30 (laughs) years with what I was doing. And he was world, he was like, even though he's high school music director, he was known throughout the country as one of the best. And um, I think every time he got bored, he said it was he said it was it's on me to figure out how to challenge myself to figure out a new way to uh, grow myself. He says nobody else is going to do that for you. So if you're not doing it for yourself, and if you're not stretching yourself and challenging yourself and figuring out how to make it not boring anymore, then uh, then you're kind of cutting your legs off you know you're really selling yourself short and that stuck with me ever since high school I've never forgotten that uh you know teachers have a lot of influence over over kids and the things they say um so that really stuck with me and he helped me out throughout my early stages of doing audio and stuff of how to motivate and get busy and get on it and uh don't let don't slack and um stay motivated so I give a lot of credit to him. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's, it, it makes it tough. You know, you have to, you have to do it, have to, whether you do less, you know, or have a little less money, do a little less corporate to push yourself to do some of these other projects that you want to do. Uh, I think it's well worth, uh, longevity, you know, keeping your longevity in the business or mm-hmm. surviving in the business. And, you know, the definition of making it in the business is uh making a living doing what you love to do yeah but you know i um in another way thinking about that that monotony and and how not to be bored made you know i've kind of thought about that myself and try to figure out how that's why one of the reasons why i left my career is shooting uh sports you know i was shot in magic games for 15 seasons but i was just getting bored with it and it just didn't, I just wasn't feeling fulfilled in that. So one thing that I've started to do is to, when we're out on these shows and we're, we're, we're gone from our family, I'm trying to take time to get to know the people that I'm working with more. You know, stop, stop oh, yeah. having that surface relationship. Let's, let's get deep. You know, let, tell me about your background. How did you get here? You know, part, kind of the whole purpose of the production channel in a way to, for uh-huh. us to, to reach out and try to get to know each other b- better and understand how the struggles that we go through in this industry and how we can support one another. Uh, how can we help each other to see, to b- have that work-life balance or to push through a challenging situation and not get stressed out and to feel that sense of fulfillment. You know, I started a, uh, 
uh, Facebook groups for video projectionists just so that we can have something, somewhere to go to yeah. support one another, help each other. You know, uh, when we're trying to figure out a new piece of gear, we might be stuck. Or even the classes that I'm um, beginning to start teaching, Projection 101, just to help that yeah. next generation yeah. come up and have a sense of... Uh, I don't I, I'm doing it, but I don't know why I'm doing it, but it seems to work out at the end, you know, but <laughs> no, just... uh, it's super awesome. I think it I think it's so, so smart. And I think uh, it, it allows and you know what the, the, the younger generation coming up wanting to do this stuff, they've got to be so thankful because a lot of us didn't have a lot of that, you know, right. So exactly. Good, good on you for that. That's that's just amazing. And I think uh, yeah, the sense of community, it is a small industry, relatively, spe- relatively speaking, right? So mm-hmm. I think um, if we're all taking care of one another, it, it's uh, it's kind of a good thing. And I, there's some unwritten rules, right? There's some uh, respect uh, on uh, people's uh, clientele and things of that nature that uh, that is always important. And if you don't uh, show the younger generation the benefits of that, um you know, in the unwritten rules, uh, how else are they going to know it? Right. And how else are they going to appreciate it? So I think that's, I think it's awesome. It's definitely a a smart thing to do. And it also, like you said, you know, a little more fulfillment as far as uh, when it comes to people and not just um, this technical side we do. Yeah. If you invest in people, you're, you'll be a lot more wealthier than investing in gear. Yeah, and, and to put it in perspective, you know, I have a, I've had um, other friends that work, you know, desk jobs, and they say, "Oh man, I wish my job was as cool as your job." You know, like, I hear that. I'm sure you guys hear that sometimes too. And 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 when I've said, and I can't take credit for this quote. I actually, I got to give Kevin Bridges quote for this uh, or credit for this quote. He said, "I don't want it to say on my tombstone, here lies the greatest audio guy ever." So, mm-hmm. you know, so that puts in perspective, like. Sometimes it's what you do to, you know, make a living and pay for your, you know, family and your kids because ultimately it's it's a job, you know. I mean, it's important, uh, no doubt about it, but it's a, it's a job, you know, and uh, family and, and people are more important and friends are more important at the end of the day uh, than uh, just what we do for a living, right? Yeah. Definitely. That's cool, man. So, what? what tell us a little bit about uh, just Steve Mitchell. Where you know where are you based out of? Talk to us a little about your family. You mentioned you have a little girl. How's the whole work life world? Uh, how do you, how do you make all that work? Um. Well, thankfully, I, I got to say I have a very very understanding wife. Um. That uh, she she is probably uh, that's a blessing all in itself is having somebody with you that uh, understands and is okay with the business uh, and being Mm -hmm. traveling and stuff like that and from the outsider perspective looking in it looks like we're gone all the time but that's not always the case Um, you know there's times where we're home for a month at a time Mm -hmm. uh, or a couple weeks at a time and that's quality time like I'm home home and Mm -hmm. uh, and and it, it, you know, we're doing whatever, whatever my daughter wants to do, whatever my family wants to do. We're, we're trying to take advantage of that time. And, uh, you know, it might not be technically in the vacation season, but we may go take a vacation on a week, you know, here or there. Um, you know, and to answer where we're at, we're just outside of Nashville, uh, Hendersonville, Gallatin area. And, um, you know, since we moved here, uh, things are a little more you know, slower pace than Orlando. We were living in Orlando for 15 years and, um, schools are a little bit smaller and things of that nature. And I think it just kind of fits, uh, my wife's, um, lifestyle and, and mine as well. It's just a little more laid back, a little less fast paced because we're always working in cities that are fast paced anyway. So it allows um, you to downshift when you get home. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, we're able to see some wildlife outside and stuff like that, and that's fun. Um, yeah, exactly. Just kind of roll it back a few notches, um, mm-hmm. and so it works out. There, that's a common thing you hear where people, uh, our industry, like we're traveling to these to Vegas, right? You know, whatever, eight times a year, or to <laughs> Manhattan, or to Orlando. Um, and but then we're coming home to these like quieter, smaller places. You know, I think people like. 
uh, friends of ours that are in Montana, you know, <laughs> right, <laughs> or, right. or Tommy who's got like, you know, or used to have a cabin up in North Carolina. I think he's in Georgia. Oh, yeah. But point being like that whole approach of I go to the busy to go work, but then I retreat, you know, to the quiet and to my home and to my family. I think that's fascinating. Anytime I think about some of these production companies, like the agency ones in like New York City, you know, the, the idea of chaos in the city or the busyness of that even like in your office then yeah. you're going to the show or it's another type of you know sort of busy frantic chaos yeah. and then when you come home you're still coming home and you're but you're going to the office and working inside this you know a place and so again we need those those sort of production companies to exist because those are the ones who sort of book the gigs and then you know we get to come out on them but particularly on this call the three of us where it's more of uh, either show operators or vendors, we don't have to do that, right? We get to just go and then be off, you know, and then go and then be off, which is, uh, that is, I think, one of the more um, beautiful parts of this industry. You know, to an extent, we're almost like um, performers or talent, you know, <laughs> where like you're on and then you're off, yeah. you know, and not to like say that we like juggle balls, you know, and we come back <laughs> You know, but it, it is to an extent like we have these on periods and then we have off. And you, we were doing a call with uh, Richard Dunn, and I'm sure this applies to you too, um, you know, Steve, where when you're home, even though you're off, you sor- sort of still are on. You know, you're, you're emailing or you're doing sure, conference yeah. calls, things like that. But, we're, I mean, the on in relation to I'm a producer on staff with a production company, and when I come home, I actually go back to the office where there's – 50 people doing conference meetings all the time and preparing for the next, you know, 20 gigs this year. It's just a very different type of like off. Does does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I'm still working on drawings and, you know, you know, paperwork and stuff like that for my next gig. Uh, But I can kind of pick and choose when I want to do that. When my daughter goes Mm -hmm. to bed and uh, I can take advantage of that time at night where, you know, and during the day I can, you know, spend all the time with her. So, it's definitely, um, it, it, we found a way to balance it. Um, uh, and my wife thankfully is, is very accepting of it. And, uh, she's been so great about it. She's kind of very familiar with the business. So it's, um, when you find somebody else who's okay with it, um, uh, you can make it work, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, uh, Steve, does your wife work? Uh, she did for a long, long time when we were in Orlando. And Uh-oh. since we moved, uh, to Nashville, um, do we just haven't had a chance to uh, get to know as many businesses and stuff like that? So she hasn't been working; yeah. she's been at home. But it's been great; it's been a blessing for our daughter because uh, she's able to concentrate more on helping her with school and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And and we watched her uh, really just thrive on it, and she's just eating it up. And it and it seems like a good time for her to be doing that right now. So she misses working and she misses being a career, uh, woman, but she, uh, she also loves this too. So, uh, I always tell her it's up to her, whatever she wants to do, I'm fine with. But, uh, I think we both know that our daughter's just eating it up right now that, yeah. uh, that she's home. Yeah. So yeah. that's cool. Well, Hey Steve. So, uh, it's kind of a, a fun last one. Do you have any good war stories or anything like that? You know, rig fell out of the sky or CEO's <laughs> mic dropped out. Do you have any go-to war stories? Oh my goodness, it's so hard to uh, pick pick <laughs> There's one. There's too many. <laughs> um, there was. Uh, I guess if I go back far enough, then there's you know we're not legally bound to anything, any kind of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> there's, some, yeah, there's some kind of statute of limitation. So if I go back to like Disney days or something like that, yeah. I think uh, I'll tell a story about that. Um, we had, um, we talked about IBM. It was a, mm-hmm. a high exec of IBM and they wanted to do this big, uh, what they called a magic mirror reveal. And it's funny if anybody listens to this, they're going to be like, don't tell that story. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, they, uh, they were, there was a technician that their job was to pull the magic mirror and there was this flash pot that was supposed to go off. And, uh, and then that technician was supposed to tell them, okay, now it's okay to step through this magic mirror. And then once they step through and the smoke clear, the mirror would be closed and magically he appears, right? <laughs> they were always about this gimmicky stuff, Disney. They were all about it. 
the problem was is uh, I think they were a little understaffed. And uh, so the technician, in order to just pull this big sliding mirror, it was all they could do. To, like they had to muscle into it. And so the cue came, they heard it on the headset, and they pulled the mirror. And when he went, they went back to like tell the CEO or the executive when to walk forward. The CEO walked forward as soon as the mirror moved. So uh, <laughs> nonetheless, he walked right through a flash pot and oh. uh, singed <laughs> the snot out of his suit. Oh no! <laughs> as his eyebrows, everything, right? Oh and, my uh, gosh! Yeah, within minutes. Uh, they had suits uh, from all the, probably the legal team probably flew in from California or something like that really fast to, please don't sue us. And, uh, <laughs> oh, my goodness. But uh, it, it was funny, and thankfully the guy had a really good, he was, he was okay, and he had a really good sense of humor about it. The next day when he came out on stage, he brought a fire extinguisher with him <laughs> and set nice. it down next to the podium. <laughs> so... So like that that guy's a good sport. Of course, he's probably got lifelong uh, Disney tickets from here on out. But uh, right, right. But uh, yeah. So yeah, anyway, that's a that good one. Like <laughs> has nothing to do with audio either. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most of them don't. You know, that's the funny thing. Yeah, it was like not not so, not my department. <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, that's cool, so. man. Well, Steve, I really appreciate uh, uh, you joining us today, man. This was awesome. No, I appreciate it. It's an honor to talk to you guys. Uh, I love seeing you guys and working with you guys, and I'm sure I'll see Clem here before too long. Hopefully yeah, uh, I come back right. to Orlando. I'll visit you in your office there, Steve. Yeah, you should. I know I don't get to gig as much anymore, but, uh, hey, I get to go to a normal 9 to 5 job, only it's way more fun and interesting. So, yeah, it's cool, man. It. Yeah, yeah. You, got a great, you got a great gig, man. I love it. Well, thank you guys very much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Well, hey, uh, again, you guys have been listening to the production channel. Uh, this is the kind of stuff you get. This is uh, real stories from real people around our industry. So um, we really just appreciate you today, Steve. And uh, for everybody else out there, if you have a great idea or a great war story or something you want to share, please do reach out to Clem or I, uh, uh, and we'd love to get you on here. With that said, uh, we'll catch you guys next week on the production channel. Chatter. Chatter.